Good morning, party people, and welcome to uh, Hoover Dam. I'm about a half hour outside of Vegas. It's always amazing. Uh, I have so many friends who say, I can't believe you live in Vegas. I could never possibly live there. I can do like three days there max. And then when you ask them what they did, it's they, they were on the strip, they spent all their money at high-end restaurants, they drank too much, they ate high-sodium foods, they partied, went to clubs, uh, went out shopping, and of course, after three days, you're broke and exhausted, and uh, no surprise there. But if you just get off the strip, I love the strip. The Vegas Strip's absolutely amazing. We're there all the time. But if you get off the strip, even just half an hour, an hour outside of Vegas, there's some truly amazing stuff. I love Hoover Dam. I think it's absolutely spectacular. Pictures don't do it justice. Uh, but you really got to go on the tour. There's a walking tour through Hoover Dam. And that's the point where you get to go to the bottom of the dam. You can't just drive up to the bottom. And when you look up from the bottom, you get a scope of how big that thing really is. It's also neat how it's changed over time, too. Uh, the, you, could, you drive right over it. You drive right over the dam in order to get here. And uh, those big, huge towers uh, are like water ingestion towers. I remember when I was in my 20s coming here, uh, and the water was all the way up to the tops of those towers. Really crazy how far the water has dropped. And you see it around Lake Mead, too. They're real clear marks as to where the water used to be. It's also a beautiful bridge over there, the Callahan-Tillman uh, Memorial Bridge. Really pretty. There's so many vantage points here, so many little twisting roads you can park on. I had a tough time picking out where I was going to film uh, today's office hours. It's cold, as you can see with my little beanie hat on. It's uh, uh, in the upper 40s this morning. And this is what happens out in the desert overnight. The temperatures just drop. And then as soon as the sun comes up, it well, it warms right back up again. There's usually a 30 degree Fahrenheit swing in between uh, night and day. It's pretty radical. So let's take a look at your top voted questions from over at PollGab. I haven't looked at these ahead of time. Usually I look at stuff ahead of time to kind of vet it out and make sure it makes sense. I did not do that today, so I may get uh, blindsided by stuff. The Princess and the Frag asks, on SQL Server 2019 and later, are reorganizing a column store index and triggering the tuple mover both the same thing? I thought 2019 makes the tuple mover clean up deleted rows, but I seem wrong. Yeah, a lot of people had this uh, confusion, and I talk about it in my Fundamentals of Column Store class as well, that an alter index reorganize doesn't delete, uh, truly delete deleted rows. Um, the SQL Server, or the Microsoft team, brought out uh, trace flags that will influence that behavior so that you can trigger the tuple mover when you want. Because by default, it looks at the row groups and says, oh, you don't have that much work to do. I'll just kick it in randomly at some other time, probably when you're under load. So there's a trace flag. I don't remember what the trace flags are, but uh, if you go to my Fundamentals of Column Store class or if you just Google for uh, SQL Server 2019 tuple mover trace flags, there are trace flags that you can turn on to influence that behavior. Uh, next up, uh, Toctic asks, uh, what deciding factors what, what must one consider when marking a table for update statistics? You know, you often hear me say, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And, and the, so that, that's the, the first thing that I would ask is why are you updating statistics? And I'm not saying they don't need to be updated, but people often think, well, they, they need to be up to date in order to get accurate execution plans. Well, kind of. But if you think about a statistic based on, say, customer name, how often does that data distribution really change? Have you all of a sudden got a, oh my God, we had 1,000 Alex's sign up yesterday. We've, now the data is mostly Alex's. You know, the, the data distribution on stuff like that just doesn't really change very often. Sales by product ID, sales by salesperson ID, those statistics, they just don't really change that often. And when you update statistics, you are triggering recompiles for queries in the plan cache. So you might have a great query plan in the cache, but because you're up updating stats on a column that really isn't changing at all, you are triggering parameter sniffing. 
So I used to be of the opinion a long time ago that I would update statistics with full scan every night just because I could, but then I would wonder why in the morning I'd come into work and I'd have all these parameter sniffing problems and I could never get query stable plans, stable query plans. So these days I tend to think more of leave it alone and do it once a month unless there's a problem you need to solve. And the problem that you're gonna to need to solve is gonna be on specific statistics. Sure, update those more often, perhaps a sales date or an inventory date that really does churn all the time. But on the stuff that doesn't really change much, that where the skew doesn't change much, why not avoid parameter sniffing? Avoid the problems of your plan cache constantly getting uh, turned over. Next up, Adrian. Oh, my phone's going into sleep here free, frequently. Let me go fix that. Um, Adrian asks, let's go in and show it. Adrian says, a customer wants several new features added to our product that require big changes to the database, but says he needs to know details of why the cost is what it is. How can I explain this to him without going into technical details? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so customers will ask me all the time, hey, Brant, I'm going to go deploy a new cluster. I'm going to go build new availability groups, high availability and disaster recovery. Can you quote me a price? Sure, but we're going to have to work together for a couple of days to sketch out what your plan looks like to look at the existing environment before I can quote you a price. Some environments are really simple. They only have a database or two. The database doesn't change much. So nobody's put anything stupid into the system databases. Uh, there aren't a lot of trace flags or linked servers. Other environments are a hot, hairy mess where they have all kinds of legacy stuff that they put in, extended stored procedures, they're storing things in master that don't fail over, they have six gajillion agent jobs that nobody understands. So the way that I explain that with customers is, if you want an exact estimate, we're going to have to do a two-day review first, really digging into that environment and assessing the staff to see what parts they're going to be able to do out of the project versus what parts you want me to do. I would say the same thing with your customer. I'd say, look, off the top of my head, I'm worried that this is going to be really complex. For me to give you specifics on exactly what it'll take me, it would probably take me a day or two, whatever your estimate is, in order to dig through the code, dig through the database, and make a list of the things that I would have to do. It may turn out to be really simple. I just don't know with any degree of confidence. Are you cool with me spending a day or two digging into this and documenting so that then we can meet up and discuss it? And most customers will understand where you're coming from there, that you're just not going to have those answers right off the top of your head. If you did, then it would be really easy. But sometimes even building the list of work, like with what you're describing here, is going to take time. Somebody's going to ask how I handle that with customers in terms of billing, and it's flat out a billable charge. For me to do that work with you, it is absolutely billable. That's not for free. Depending on how some customers do it, they'll say they'll give it as a, or how some consultants do it. They'll say, say it costs $5,000. I'll give you that five grand back as a credit if you book the whole engagement with me after we've done our discovery. The way that I do it is I say, here's the price for those two days worth of labor. If at the end of the two days worth of labor, your staff believe that they can just run with the plan that we built together, great. Take that plan, run with it, Godspeed. You know, you've paid me, we've gotten the value out of this engagement. If you want to book me for the rest of the work, we'll have a detailed statement of work at that time. Next up, Bobo asks, I've heard recently that people refer to SQL Server and other databases as legacy databases. What makes you think when you hear that, what makes you, I'm not quite sure what the rest of that means. Um, yeah, that's not unusual for anything that's been around for 10 or 20 years for people to call it legacy, um, especially in the advent of NoSQL systems. People for a while there were saying that NoSQL was the future uh, and that relational was legacy. 
policy, that's totally okay. If that's a term that they want to use, it doesn't bother me at all. Then again, I'm old and people can use all kinds of derogatory terms towards me if they want to. I have no problem with that. I live a comfortable life and you can call me whatever you like because that's an indication of you. It is not an indication of me. Uh, next up, Palm Canyon says, I suspect that an app is executing updates, but not actually updating any data. They're pretty active tables, so I'm wondering if there's other, anything other than CDC or sys versioning that I could use to help prove it. Yeah, trigger. Trigger. That's exactly what triggers are really good at. So you can put a trigger in there and you can check to see which columns have been modified. Now you're going to have to roll this code. It's not like a, a really simple if this is anything other than that. Um, but you can put in a trigger and then if no rows are being mod or if no columns are being modified in none of the rows, uh, you can log to a table. You can log the application that's doing it, the query that they're running and so forth. That's the way that I would do it. Um, and I would uh, do it during just short periods, you know, enable it for say half an hour at a time, uh, and then go get a real quick look at uh, whether or not it makes sense. Next up, Don't Bother Asking says, when my friend runs SP Blitz cache, it returns a forced indexes warning on some trouble queries. The SQL code doesn't contain any index hints. What could potentially cause these warnings in that case? In the, so SP Blitz cache returns two sets of results. The first set is the set of uh, queries and warnings. The second set is a decoder ring that for every uh, warning, it tells you more information about it, plus gives you a URL. Take that URL, copy paste it into your browser and read there. And there's gonna be much more details about that particular thing. Start there. Uh, next up, Joseph says, Hey Brent, SQL Constant Care flagged a resource semaphore wait. My SQL Server has 16 gigs of RAM. Woo! 16 gigabytes! Oh my goodness! 16 gigabytes of RAM! That's amazing! Wow! Where did you find the budget for that? 1998? Man, so that's incredible! 16 gigs! Wow! trying to think back to the last time I had a laptop with 16 gigs of RAM. That's a tale as old as time, isn't it? I can't imagine how you're running out of memory when you have 16 gigabytes of RAM. Guess that's a mystery we'll never know. Uh, next up, my T got cold. Says your ballpark license, your ballpark figures for SQL Server licensing are great. What ballpark figures do you use for how much RAM should cost? No, I don't. The nice thing about RAM is you can just go Google for it really quickly. You can go to Amazon, put in your server make and model, and you'll get a, a rough idea of what RAM costs. If you want to buy it from an enterprise reseller, generally like double whatever prices you see on Amazon. You can also go see it really quickly for the cloud providers. Uh, just go look it up. It's really easy. And, and I don't, uh, the reason why I'm giving you that is it changes so quickly and it changes depending on your server make and model. Uh, some server make and models uh, require very specific kinds of memory that's more expensive. So just go check that out. Rebello asks, how do I know if I've lost data on restart on an instance with databases that have delayed durability forced? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> how do I know if I've lost data? Um, okay, so the whole reason delayed durability goes faster is that it doesn't log to disk until later. Well, if your SQL server crashes, where do you think you're going to find that you lost data? Because it never made it to disk. If you want to log it, don't use delayed durability. If you can't afford to lose data, don't use delayed durability. The documentation for delayed durability flat out says you will lose data on regular restarts. SQL Server doesn't even guarantee that it flushes the cache to disk or flushes the transaction log to disk on a normal restart, like when you restart the SQL Server service. So. It's the whole point of that feature. It goes faster because it's all YOLO with your data. 
Uh, Lazy Dev asks, regarding security, I created service accounts for all my services, granted permission, SQL Server uses little to no memory under that user, queries are slow, what would a minimal checklist look like? I don't know what that has to do with security. It's almost like saying, hi Brent, my car is red, tell me why it won't go faster. That's like totally irrelevant. Go check out my training classes. It sounds like it's time for you to check out my training classes because if you're, when your server is slow, if you start by looking at security, it's not that you missed the boat. You're not even looking for the boat. You're like, I'm trying to cross that lake over there, but how come I can't find a, 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 a I can't even come up with an analogy. That is so far off. Not even close. Go report to training classes. Uh, next up, Cap'n BMAC says, it's perhaps, you've certain, perhaps you've addressed this previously and simply I missed it. At some point, the mighty Ozar retires from the world of databases and providing stellar DBA content. Is there a rising DBA star who shares your passion and talent? Oh, there are always lots of them. There are always lots of people who do uh, scripts, who do blog posts, who do uh, uh, like GitHub repos. And I try to link to them all in my weekly emails. So uh, if you subscribe to my weekly emails, if you go to brentozar.com slash subscribe, every week I link to five to 10 different articles from people that I find really interesting, uh, things that I think that you should read. Start following their blogs. For example, uh, in the as we say this, tomorrow's email newsletter, which depending on when this video goes out is already in the past, uh, but tomorrow's email newsletter is all chock full of scripts by Eric Darling. Eric uh, used to work with me. He's a phenomenal, genius guy. I hear a helicopter going by. Oh, a whole crew of helicopters. Um, uh, he's a very smart guy, does blogging, does videos, does uh, GitHub repo. And I promote other folks all the time, all the time. That's what my weekly newsletter is all about. Next up, Marcus the German says, can SQL Server have too much RAM? For example, putting a single 10 gigabyte database on a server with 512 gigs of RAM. Marcus, that is my sign to stop taking questions because what in the Sam hell is the problem that you are trying to solve? Are you worried that you spent too much money? Did you really put a 10 gigabyte database on a server with 512 gigs of RAM? If you are genuinely worried about that, go into your boss and say, why is my budget so large? Are we a money laundering front for the mafia? On second thought, you probably shouldn't ask that because I don't know that you really want to hear the answer. Marcus, if you're working for a drug lord, if you're working for an import-export business, wink, wink, that's putting 10 gigabyte databases on servers with 512 gigs of RAM, you should thank your lucky stars. You should never ask questions out on the internet again because you don't want that import-export business to get into any trouble with the law. Got it? Wink, wink. Hope you all had fun today and learned something, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.